Hello again, everybody, and welcome to allprophecyfulfilled.com on the World Wide Web, and of course on Facebook and YouTube, simply All Prophecy Fulfilled, where we are continuing our series, The Last Days, Biblically Defined, and uh, it's been a while, it's been about a month, and... Um, all I can really do is apologize about about that for those of you who are, who are following along. I know it can be kind of difficult to follow a series. It may seem a bit disjointed and uh, it's hard to follow that that flow uh, when they're not put out on a regular basis. I, you know, I, my goal really is to do one per week and I just don't ever seem to hit that mark. So. What can, what can I do except say, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, you can always go back and review the previous segments and that might refresh your memory. Uh, I, you know, what can I tell you? In the words of Bruce Hornsby, that's just the way it is. So anyway, we have arrived at Daniel. Finally, as promised, the book of Daniel, the ever popular, the ever controversial book of Daniel, or as every uh, prophecy teacher, every prophecy pundit out there uh, claims, Daniel, the key to unlocking Bible prophecy, something like that. Um, you got to have that voice. Now look, I'm not exactly sure as to really how I want to approach Daniel, or at least how much detail uh, that I really want to get into. And it's not that I'm afraid of rolling up my sleeves and, and getting dirty in the details, but honestly, I don't think that I really have to go into much detail to prove the one point that this series is demonstrating that the only last days taught in Scripture are past days. And those last days are the last days of God's old covenant people, Israel, who came to their covenantal end in the first century. Now, the problem is, if I'm not careful, man, there are so many little rabbit trails and that I could go down to a lot of side streets, details that we could engage in that while I think they're important, they're not really germane to the simple case uh, that I have set out to demonstrate. So I will do my best to keep it uh, simple and to the point. So now might be a good time, I think, uh, to remind you of our approach uh, in this series and really the simple simplicity of this study. Uh, we are basically looking at two key words, akarith and kates, okay? And we're, we're basically allowing the prophets to define the last days for us. We're trying to get out of their way, if you will, and let them speak. Let them explain what and, and when the last days are or were. So we uh, when we do actually arrive at the New Testament, uh, we're going to have an accurate, working, biblical definition of the last days. Having built our, our prophetic understanding on the first two-thirds of the Bible, as opposed to starting, say, in Matthew 1.1. Um, you know, I, and that's the point. See, I, I'm afraid that too many people really begin in the New Testament. And I tell you what, if we do that, uh, we will not be equipped. We will not be prepared uh, for what we are actually reading in the New Testament. So, in fact, if we really want to know what the biblical last days are, but we begin in the New Testament, honestly, uh, the only thing that we may have to go on or start with is a preconceived uh, idea as to what the last days are. And what do we base that on? Well, probably what our pastors tell us or what the latest uh, Hal Lindsey book tells us or novel, whatever you want to call it. And, and what I'm saying is, no, please don't depend on your pastor. Uh, roll up your sleeves and do the work yourself. That's what I'm asking you to do. We can and we should equip ourselves so that we can see uh, what the Bible means by what the Bible says. And in order to do that, I think we have to put on the correct interpretive lenses or lens to look through. And one of those necessary lenses that I'm talking about is audience relevance. We're trying to peer through the, the lenses and see the perspective of the Old Testament prophets and their immediate audiences. And we're trying to recognize where they got their message from. Where did the prophets get their message from? 
Yeah, Deuteronomy, good job. And how they conveyed their message, that is, how did they use language to describe things and how their immediate audience might have understood those words. We, um, not that their immediate audience really understood all their words, but the point is we must pay attention to the prophets and how they repeat words or phrases and ideas, and, and not just their own, but how they reiterate what the other prophets said and how the whole of prophetic uh, writings kind of snowballs or kind of kind of morphs together, forming the many, many, many Old Testament prophetic last days themes that I talk so much about. So then when we do that, when we're aware of that, and when we, when we study in that regard, when we actually do arrive at the New Testament or in the New Testament, we have been rooted in and prepared uh, by the Old Testament prophets, and we are able to recognize the language uh, of the New Testament writers. Why? Well, because it seems familiar. It's as if the New Testament writers, as, it's as if their message is a familiar echo uh, of something we've read before. Uh, then a light goes on, and, and we're like, you know, uh, hey, wait a minute, you know, Peter, Paul, uh, John, James, all of them, and I mean all of them, are telling us that all the things that were spoken of by the prophets has arrived or had arrived in their day. Okay, so those recognizable Old Testament prophetic last days thing, themes that kind of spring out of the message of Moses in Deuteronomy and were developed by the prophets uh, are coming to fulfillment in their day. And that is the message of the New Testament prophets. The last days had arrived. They had arrived. And we know this with certainty. You know how we know this? Well, one of the ways is because every time a New Testament writer uh, uh, uses a, uh, attaches a, a citation uh, or a what I like to call a hyperlink to the point that they're making in their letter time and time again by clicking on that hyperlink, that Old Testament hyperlink, the New Testament writers are basically screaming at us. You know, they're saying, this is that. This is that. Go back to that prophet and see what he was talking about. And this is that. So what I'm saying is that to begin a last day study uh, in the New Testament, it's kind of like jumping into the story uh, literally at the end or near the end of the story. Now think about it. How presumptuous really is it uh, of us if we were to, to jump uh, into a story when there's really only a couple chapters to go and we, we assume we know how it will end uh, without really knowing the first two thirds of the book. Uh, the truth of the matter is the first two thirds of the Bible is actually pointing at uh, a specific end and it's explaining what that end was and who it pertained to uh, and how it would happen and why it would happen. And that's why we're going through this process uh, in uh, this particular series. It's because uh, we want to allow the prophets or allow Scripture alone to establish a working definition of the last days and continue to develop the definition for us. Um, all the way up uh, the long, all the way up uh, to the long-awaited Messiah, right? What we call the New Testament times. And I tell you what, I get lambasted all the time with comments on YouTube and Facebook with very uh, general rebuttals, very general statements, and they claim that you know I'm not just wrong, but I'm a false teacher. But here's what they do. This is interesting. They basically copy and paste these long passages of Scripture that are sub somehow supposed to prove their point uh, or their accusation against me. And, and I'm reading and I'm thinking, well, I could do that. I, I could just, you know, cut and paste this very long passage of scripture and say, oh, see, that proves my point. But that doesn't accomplish anything. And then when I respond, you know, by, by asking them to simply provide, give me one Old Testament verse or one Old Testament passage that teaches the end of planet Earth, uh, you know, the end of something beyond the, the Mosaic Age or Mosaic Covenant, and explain to me how that verse demonstrates that and how they arrived at their conclusion 
attention, but they never respond other than that because they can not provide such a passage, such a scripture. Now, my question is, why is that an important question? If I were to ask you, okay, can you provide me a, a passage of scripture in the Old Testament that demonstrates or teaches the end of planet Earth? Why is that an important question? Well, hear me out. If there is an end to planet Earth as we know it, and scripture teaches it, okay, that end must come in the last days. Would you agree with that? Well, certainly, I think you would. Okay, let me remind you here, and this is important, um, <clears throat> of our agreed upon starting point in this series. I covered this in the first and second videos. And if you didn't catch this, you ought to go back and, and catch that, okay? I presented three questions that, I, that I'm positive we can all agree upon. Okay, uh, I called it my, uh, our common ground, and we started from there. Do you remember what those questions were? Let me refresh your memory. I asked you, number one, would you agree? Number one, the Bible alone defines its own terms. You agree with that? Number two, the Bible teaches a coming. Now, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it a return. You can call it an appearing for a, a second time. Uh, but the Bible teaches a coming after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, and that coming was future to the New Testament writers. Do you agree with that? Good. Number three, the Bible teaches that this coming would occur when? In the last days. Now, do you agree with all of those? Okay, then. Now, what I'm telling you that is that if the Old Testament, uh, if those scriptures speak of only one eschatological end, one eschatological last days, uh, it's and it's the last days of Old Covenant Israel, the end of the Mosaic Age, then when we get to the New Testament, and this is important, man, I tell you, you, my friend, are going to be in a world of hurt because as you will see, the New Testament writers did not, I repeat, they did not suddenly start preaching some other end, some other latter days that was different from what all the Old Testament prophets taught, okay? Uh, now, we're going to get to that when we arrive in the New Testament. Uh, but for now, please, you need to stay with me here in the Old Testament until we get there. The question at hand is a simple one, but it is critical to answer if we're going to be honest when we actually get to the New Testament text. And we will get there. And again, our question at hand is simple, and it is this. How did the Old Testament prophets define the last days, the latter days? And up to this point, I think you know the answer to that. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to every single verse in Daniel that contains either one of these two words, akarith and kates. And I'm going to provide just a wee bit of context. And I'm going to quickly explain why and how all these verses, all these verses are using Akarith and Kates in the exact same way that all the other prophets do and how they, there is never, and I mean never, an instance in Daniel where the word Akarith or Kates uh, is used to describe, predict, prophesy, teach um, any end, any latter days uh, that are future to you and me. Think about that. It just ain't there, folks. And I tell you what, there are a lot of Akaris and a lot of Kates mentioned in Daniel. I think right around 20. It might be exactly 20. So as far as today, because I kind of got preachy there and I went off a little bit on a little diatribe, um, I'm only going to cover one verse, just one little measly verse here. And uh, I'm going to give you a little flavor of what I'm going to be doing going forward in Daniel. So, okay, here we go. The very first occurrence of Akarith, or Kates, is found in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. Daniel 2, 28. Let me get her here. Okay. Daniel 2, 28. 2, 28. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in 
the latter days. Now that latter right there is akarith, and you got days, which is from yom. So you got latter days. That's akarith. Now the context here, basically Daniel is speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar, and. Um, I want you to notice here that Daniel does not, I mean, he does not here specify exactly what latter days old King Neb saw. So we can rightly ask the question, and I think we should, uh, the latter days of what? Or the latter days of who? You know, exactly. Well, it becomes evident when Daniel proceeds to give uh, the interpretation. So we kind of have to reserve judgment here until we get more information. Okay, so Daniel describes five kingdoms. That's right, five kingdoms. You got Nebuchadnezzar's, you got three that would follow his, and then you have the kingdom of God that would be set up in the days or during that fourth kingdom. Um, and he, Daniel says here in 244, and in the days of these kings, he's speaking of the fourth kingdom there, uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now look, the vast majority of scholars and teachers and commentators and all that, they identify that fourth kingdom as Rome, the Roman Empire, and that may very well be the case. I'm not going to dispute that, but you know what? I have heard other propositions that I think are at least worth considering, but as of right now, I do lean towards the Roman Empire. Now, I've heard many alternate suggestions. You've got the Roman Catholic Church, you got Islam, you got the Seleucid Kingdom, uh, you've got some today are saying Russia and China or some nation in our future. And recently, I have heard some suggest that Israel herself was that fourth kingdom, specifically when uh, Israel regained her, her independence, uh, beginning with the, the Maccabean revolt around 167, 164 BC. And you know what, I'm gonna be honest with you here, if you don't mind, just for a second. I find this proposition intriguing. In fact, uh, you know, I really have taken a, a good hard look at this with my Bible open, with my mind open, with some articles open, uh, and I find Israel as the fourth kingdom somewhat exegetically compelling, I have to admit, for a few reasons, uh, but just not compelling enough uh, to swallow it whole just yet. I, I've got a little more work to do on that. Now, I would like to take some time to explain this a little bit further, uh, and I think I will, but not until we get to chapter 7, 8, and, and, and 11, where Daniel, again, uh, he has visions of, of the rising of, of subsequent kingdoms after Babylon and and that pertain to the time of the end. But again, I'm not sold on this idea just yet. I, I still think Rome is the more reasonable suggestion for a few reasons. But again, I really do want to address this uh, later on, and I probably will again when I get to 7, 8, and 11. And by the way, the truth is, even if this were the case, even if this, this idea is Israel as the fourth kingdom uh, were the case, it really wouldn't make a lick of difference in our overall conclusions as far as what end is in sight. So for today's segment, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask that you just humor me for one second, just for now. Let's assume or let's agree for argument's sake that the fourth kingdom is Rome, just for, just for today. And I will address this later. And I know that most of you probably agree with that anyway, but some probably don't. And I will address this issue of the fourth kingdom later. So according to Daniel chapter 244, God's kingdom would be set up in the days of this fourth kingdom, in the days of these kings. Well, there really shouldn't, <laughs> I say that all the time, there really shouldn't be any controversy when I say that God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of Messiah, okay, was clearly established, was clearly set up sometime or around the arrival of Messiah. It's it's the messianic kingdom for Pete's sake, okay? And I say it shouldn't be controversial, but of course, everybody seems to have a different opinion on this, right? Okay, so some, some say that Messiah's kingdom was not established, but will be established upon his return in the future. Some say it was 
partly established. As for me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the words of John the Forerunner, of Jesus and his apostles on this. I think that would be the wise route. So what was their message? When did they say the kingdom of God would come, would arrive, would be established? What did they say? How about Matthew 3, 1 and 2? In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, for Pete's sake, like I said, whoever Pete is, Isaiah foretold the forerunner. That's Isaiah 40, right? The very one who was to pre prepare the way of the Lord, he was doing just that. It wasn't because his kingdom would, would, would come someday. It was because the Messiah was on the scene and he was about to establish his kingdom through a new covenant in his blood. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, he's talking about after the temptation of Jesus, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, how come? <laughs> For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How about Luke 21, 31 through 33, speaking to his disciples. So you also, when you see these things happening, what things? What things are happening? What are they seeing? Well, there are things pertaining to the destruction of the temple that would happen in their lifetimes, in their generation. Know that the kingdom of God is near. It's near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. He's saying this here mosaic age uh, will pass. The law associated with it will pass. The, this, this heaven and earth and this temporary covenantal connection uh, between Yahweh and man is coming to an end. But my words will not. And the new everlasting covenant in my blood offered, presented, detailed, and described with my words, uh, by my words, in my words, during my ministry and in my life, though that will remain forever. Okay, then. He, that, that's what he means when he says, My words will by no means pass away. He's comparing that to that which will pass away. Okay, then. What do the disciples preach? What's their message? Well, Jesus tells them, he says, yeah, I want you to go and I want you to preach the same thing that I've been preaching. Matthew 10, 6 and 7. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 17, 20 and 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. I tell you, some people just don't like this idea that Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. That's John 18, 36. You know, it's not really a physical kingdom, although, yeah, it's, it's manifested physically, you know, through you and I here on planet Earth, sure. But it's a spiritual kingdom, and we, you and me, we are his physical representatives, his ambassadors in this world, in this realm. Look, I could cite plenty more verses about God's kingdom, but the point is, Messiah brought the kingdom with him. He was, he is the kingdom. To suggest God's kingdom is not yet established, or, you know, it's only partly established, and then, then chop up prof prophecy, really, kind of inserting a gap here and, and a gap there to kind of extend redemptive history out thousands of years. In my opinion, this is my opinion, it's almost always done uh, out of the need to conform God's kingdom to what we assume it to be. We ought not do that, right? Or what we want the Bible to teach instead of simply accepting what it does teach. The Jews made the mistake of rejecting him thereby rejecting his kingdom because they didn't like it. <laughs> they did not like his kingdom. They didn't look like what his kingdom uh, looked like. 
Okay, it, it didn't meet their expectations, but let's not make the same mistake and create a theology uh, around our preconceived ideas about his kingdom or what we think it ought to look like. The prophets foretold Messiah and the kingdom that he would bring with him. Okay, so Messiah came. I think his message was pretty clear. He's, he's like, hey, I'm here. I'm here. King's here. The kingdom of God is here with me, he's saying. He's saying, you can enter it, right? Or you can choose to reject my kingdom and you can remain outside if you don't like the terms of entering or if my kingdom doesn't fit your, uh, your, your kingdom mold. Okay, but please, 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 please do not try to enter in and then try to create the kind of kingdom that I didn't offer. Don't do that. Okay, I'm offering life now. I'm offering membership now. Okay, not 2,000 years from now. All right, but the kingdom now fully consummated within this generation. Okay, so you better jump in the Ark of Messiah because this old covenant world is going to go down in a flood of judgment and it's coming soon. It is near. So, ladies and germs, what I'm telling you is take your pick. His birth, uh, his ministry, the death, burial, resurrection, the ascension, uh, Pentecost, his promise coming in judgment, his appearing a second time apart from sin for salvation. All of these, all of these things took place in that first century. So take your pick exactly when you want to place, you know, the, the establishment of his kingdom. It really doesn't matter to me because the point is, is that either way you slice it, all these things fall within that first century time frame when God's old covenant kingdom Israel, although somewhat uh, autonomous, they were under the thumb of the Roman Empire. So I don't care if you call Rome or if you call Israel the fourth kingdom, the time frame is the same. And if we follow the historical uh, line of kingdoms from Babylon all the way down to Rome, this clearly lands us right smack down dab uh, in the first century time frame, okay? The very same time that old covenant Israel came to her prophesied end. Do you see that? Okay? By means of the Roman army. So Daniel clearly shows, he clearly shows that God would set up, the, the set up is the word kum, and that means to appoint, to establish, to, uh, to raise or to arise up, to make, to stand, to set up. He would establish his kingdom after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Medo Greece had passed away, but in the days of this fourth kingdom. Now, whether that means the Roman Empire or uh, reestablished in somewhat independent Israel after the Maccabean Revolt, beginning around 64 BC, fine with me. Take your pick. So, wrapping up here, here's my point. How does Daniel, <laughs> how does Daniel define the latter days here in 228? Well, the latter days here in chapter 2 I mean, in chapter two, at least, and we'll, we'll get to the rest, it can only be referring to the days when God would set up his kingdom that would stand forever. That's 244 in the days of that fourth kingdom. Those latter days were the days of Messiah. Those were the days when he came and he did just that. During the time when Israel was autonomous to some degree, um, but was nonetheless under the rule of that Roman Empire, when they, um, you know, they, they had initially, they had been incorporated into the Roman Republic around this in the 60s BC, but not much later, Rome would become an empire. Okay, therefore, the latter days in 228, Akarith, is defined by Daniel as the latter days of his people, Old Covenant Israel, because it was exactly then, during that fourth kingdom's existence, that the kingdom of Christ, it broke in, it was established. And you know what? You may not like this, but it has been breaking, it has been consuming, it has been defeating, shattering, every kingdom of man ever since. No, not 
overpowering earthly kingdoms. That's not what we're talking about through, through earthly physical warfare. No, the kingdom of God rules in the hearts of men. And if that's not good enough for you, I don't know what to tell you. The kingdom of God grows through spiritual conversion. The kingdom of God established a city whose gates are perpetually open to the nations, okay? And as long as individuals from those nations continue to stream into that city, that means that Christ continues to reign today. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. You have, you have a little flavor here of what we'll be doing here in, in uh, the next chapters. Um, we're going to pick up next time in the as we'll look at the next occurrence of Akarith and Cates. And I think we find that in Daniel chapter 8. So I've said enough for today. Good to be back. Thanks again for joining me. I really do appreciate it. And uh, we will see you next round. Take care, everybody. Adios.